Hello. 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 Thank you back. Thank you and welcome back to the Hudson Senior Center, uh, to the next of our, the installment of these um, uh, seminars that I've been doing, I think now for 10 years. My name is Arthur Bergeron. If you don't know me, I work at Myrick O'Connell. Myrick O'Connell, there are 60 of us. We're a multi-specialty law firm. There were 20 in Westboro. There were 40 in Worcester. As a result, I get to do nothing but this, which is Elder Law. Uh, what is Elder Law? It's dealing with all the issues that you've got pretty much after 65. When you're slowing down and your money is no longer growing unless you've got great investments. Uh, and basically, your goal in life to stop becoming fame and fortune is basically just to get a good night's sleep. So the goal of my practice is to help people sleep well at night. Now, the, a lot of the presentations that I've done, I just did one um, last month here. Um, oh, excuse me, excuse me, I'm going to mention one other thing. So I did this presentation in Marlboro last week, and because of a scheduling mix-up, the folks from Marlboro Cable didn't come. So I'm hoping that we're going to be able to get this film sent over to, the, to Marlboro so that they can see it too, for not too much of a service charge coming from Hudson's up. Marlboro. <laughs> uh, we're going to kind of work on that. So. <clears throat> Um, I, I focused on trust the last time, and we deal with a lot of those issues, and, and you've heard from me many times focus on mass health and on um, the issues about trying to qualify somebody for, for um, nursing home care and how all of that works. Um, but sometimes uh, there are, there are trade-offs to that and, and things that you need to kind of balance out in terms of deciding whether you want to do that because of the tax implications and the implications in terms of people's investments. Sometimes, even among different tax things, there were competing interests. So I thought I would do a presentation to focus on those issues, asset protection versus tax avoidance. Because when people come to see me, they usually say that they're there because they don't want to spend any money on the nursing home, and they don't want to spend any money on the government, and they don't want to spend any money on me. And so the question is, you know, how do you try to save as much money as you can? And I get it because they're saying, because we don't have a lot of money. You know, our money isn't growing anymore, our money is shrinking, and I'd rather give it to my kids than give it to you, or to the Department of Revenue, you know, or to the nursing home. So we're gonna talk about some of those issues. Now, I regret that this stuff is complicated. Right? So we're going to do a lot of math here because I have to. But remember, the goal of these presentations is not to try to give you a specific answer to your specific question, but to allow you to get a sense of whether, in general, you might have a problem. So that you'll know enough to be able to talk to folks to see if you do have a problem and, and then what, how you solve that problem. So, here we go. You know my friends. Peter Paul or Frank and Mary and their kids, Peter Paul and Mary Jr. You know that their goal in life is, remains the same. They're still in their house. They want to live there until they die. They want to be buried in the backyard. When Frank dies, uh, he wants to make sure that Mary inherits everything, unless there's some other reason to do that. And when Mary dies, she wants everything to be liquidated, which means turned into money, and divided into three piles and given to Peter Paul and Mary Jr. Um, they want to avoid paying taxes, paying the nursing home, and paying for probate. Right? They want to avoid those three things, which typically paying for probate a lot of times means paying for a lawyer. Um, so before I start, I'm going to review quickly what I'm often here talking about, which is kind of Mass Health 101, which means that if Frank and Mary are both alive and Mary goes into a nursing home, uh, Mary can almost immediately qualify for Mass Health, that is the, Mass the, the, the Massachusetts name for Medicaid, which is the program that covers nursing home costs. To qualify, Mary has to show that she has less than $2,000 in countable assets. Frank, on the other hand, can own the house as long as it has an equity of less than $828,000, can have other assets worth $119,220, and can have unlimited income. Therefore, the typical strategy in this case, if Mary's in the nursing home, assuming that we have a power of attorney from, from Mary to somebody so that we can act on her behalf, at this point, of course, she can't. Um, would be to transfer all the assets to Frank, have Frank keep his house because his equity is low enough. This is more of an issue on Nantucket now where everybody's house is worth more than 828000 I was just working with a client there. so I, And I had to look at their assessment card, the, the property assessment. They've owned this house, they're trying to save it. And so the assessment for that house, and it shows, typically the assessment card also shows transfers and the date of the transfer. So there was a transfer in you know, the 1990s for $200,000. And a transfer in the 2000s for like you know 250, and then there was a transfer in 2009 for 309 thousand dollars. And today's assessed value is a million three hundred thousand oh, dollars. That's the change from 2009. It's unbelievable. So anyway, that's this is what they're this is what they're trying to do. 
And if Frank and Mary have those assets, which are the assets that we just used last month and I've used before, if they own the house and Frank's got an IRA, they've got a small annuity and a small bank account, right? That strategy makes perfect sense. And it almost always is the right strategy. You just shift everything to Frank. He's going to have to pay some, he's not even going to have to pay a penalty by turning this um, IRA into an annuity. There's actually a way that you can do that without paying the tax on it right away. So assuming that his annuity doesn't have a penalty attached to it, um, this all makes perfect sense. If his assets are $650,000, but what if, his, what if their assets are $1,500,000? What if the home is worth more, they also have a cottage down on the Cape that they bought for nothing, you know, and now it's worth $300,000. Frank's got an IRA, but it's more money. Mary's got an IRA too. So Mary's got an IRA too. So that in order for us to do what we want to do, we'd have to sell that cottage and turn it into cash, give all the cash to Frank, have Mary cash out her IRA and pay all the taxes, and then give that cash to Frank. Perhaps even pay some kind of penalty on the annuity, transfer all the money to Frank, and then Frank's gonna buy this big uh, immediate term annuity, an annuity that pays him monthly payments over a term that is shorter than his life expectancy. But that annuity pays crummy interest, terrible. It's about like 1% right now. Well, I know, it's like bank accounts, it's like 1%. Which means that he's paying, there are significant costs to Frank and Mary of doing the things that I talked to you about to qualify Mary for mass health. She, she can definitely get qualified, but how, does they, how do they figure out whether that's the right thing to do? And how they balance that against these other things? Well, to understand that, um, and by the way, that's, that's their income. It isn't just Frank and Mary have each got a little social security. Um, Frank's getting social, Mary's got social, but they've also got the cottage and it's earning some money. And Frank's IRA, IRA is large, and he's got a good size required minimum distribution every year, which we're counting as money, and so does Mary. And that annuity pays something, and it pays much better interest than they're ever going to get from this immediate term annuity. So their income is like $55,000. So the question is, in that kind of situation, does what I'm saying make sense? Now to figure that out, Frank and Mary, and, and you folks, if you're trying to figure this out, need to know some things. Um, you need to do a, a kind of an income analysis regarding how much the cottage is yielding and therefore how much you're going to lose by selling the cottage just in terms of income, right? And converting that into this annuity that's paying 1%. You need to look at the annuity and see if the annuity is paying so much money that it isn't worth doing what I'm saying. I just had a client where they had an annuity that through some miracle, they got, you know, they got it in like 2006 or 2007 and they get, a, they get a, an income distribution every year, but this is not principal, income of 7%. It's a million dollar annuity. So she's getting $70,000 a year out of that annuity. So for them to take that annuity, cash it out, which in, by the way also means paying some taxes, and then turn it into an annuity that only generates 1% a year, means they're losing $60,000 a year. Instead of earning you know, $70,000 of their money, they're earning 10. Well, they have to weigh that against what they might be losing by paying um, the nursing home privately as opposed to being on mass health. And finally, there's the tax analysis. So, so often, I'll do this kind of presentation, or presentation, I'll be talking to clients and explain this to them. And they'll come back to me and say, oh my God, I talked to my accountant. He said, we can't do this. And I said, well, why? Well, because of the taxes. Well, how much taxes? Well, just because of the taxes, it's going to be a lot, you know. So you need to kind of understand that piece, as well as, by the way, the financial plan, right? Who would just assume that you not take the money that he's now managing, the million dollars, and shift it to someplace else that he's not managing and therefore not making any money. So he's going to tell you, among other things, obviously the investment is bad, and he's also going to say that, oh, the taxes are going to be terrible. So you need to understand those pieces. I'm so glad that that just happened. You just reminded me to shut off my phone. Because <laughs> I think one of the last times I was here, I got a call while I was doing the presentation. That looked really stupid. So, okay, let's take care. My wire's back in a moment. Man, man, I gotta look, I don't wanna look stupid. Okay, that's good. So, we're gonna spend some time talking about taxes. I know this is boring, you know, but you have to know this stuff because so much of this ends up being, these are math problems. You gotta make sure that you get you do the math problems and you gotta know whether there is a math problem. So once again, those are the assets. Right, the house, the cottage, the IRAs, the annuity, 
the tax analysis that you need to know. You need to know, this is taxes 101. We're going to tell you about income taxes, capital gains taxes, and estate taxes. All in one presentation. How exciting is this? Right? So here we go. Income taxes. You need to understand about marginal rates. The marginal tax rate. Remember Frank and Mary's total income was like $55,000, their annual income. Forget about the fact that maybe an adjustment because of Social Security. It just makes it too complicated. Just say, pretend that their taxes, their actual taxable income is $55,000. The way the federal tax system works, you've probably heard, you know, or maybe even looked at it, is that basically the federal government takes the amount of, of money that you earn and they divide it into chunks. Um, and in each one of those chunks, they tax at a different rate. Uh, and those are the rates. So if you earn, if your taxable income, this is all in your handout too. You didn't get a handout, shame on you. Um, if your taxable income is less than $9,275, right, or if it's more than that, for that piece of your income, the piece between zero and $9,275, the tax rate, or if you're married, like Frank and Mary, $18,850, the tax rate is only 10%. It's really very low, right? Uh, if, it's, if it's between $18,550 and $75,300, the tax rate is only 15% on that money, on that next chunk. And then it goes up some more, 25% on the money up to 150, 28% on the money up to 231, 33% on the money up to 413, and you start saying to yourself, why do I care about any of those numbers at the bottom, right? And the answer is, because if you're selling real estate, or cashing in IRAs or 401ks, all of a sudden you may have income that, it, that some of which is in those sections, right? It's in those marginal brackets, and therefore you're paying tax on, just federal tax, not state, just federal, at 28 or 33%. We're gonna talk about that a little bit later on. So as far as Frank and Mary are concerned, remember their income is $55,000. So this is how much they would pay in federal tax, right? From zero to 18,555 at 10%. From, from uh, excuse me, from zero to, to um, that was a mistake. This should say from, from zero to 36. Um, then from 30, then, then the, um, the um, 30, up to the $36,000, sorry. From zero, that's right. Uh, to 18,555 at 10%, and that's what they pay. And then the rest, this and this, equal 55,000. They're paying the rest at 15%, and that's their total tax. And if you want to figure out your tax, and you're not going to the accountant because you just hate them, this, there's actually a way of figuring out your own tax, and this is how you have to do it, right? If you're not going to somebody else's tax chart. The Massachusetts income tax rate is, is around 5%. It's a little bit different, but we got to get to round it off just so that you can kind of the numbers did. I don't want to just show pennies here, so it's five percent. That's how the income tax rate works. The capital gains tax. Capital gains tax gets paid whenever you sell an asset which you had bought for less, and now you're selling it for more, and you had it for at least a year. So that usually means whenever you're selling real estate and when you're selling stocks and bonds, so the two things for which you're going to pay a capital gains tax, you pay a capital gains tax at capital gains rates as opposed to the, the other stuff which you pay at ordinary income rates. There's a blend there when it comes to cottages, and we're going to talk about that. But next is capital gains. So what if Frank and Mary decide to sell their house? Remember, their house is worth now $400,000. Well, the, you, you, how much do they pay in tax? Well, they, you can't figure it out unless you know some other things. You've got to know what their tax basis is. Their tax basis. Basis is a made-up term, right? Um, and it equals purchase price plus improvements minus depreciation. Um, depreciation is only significant, significant if you're renting the property, so I'm going to talk about that later. So, um, purchase price plus improvements, right? Um, that's their basis. And, and, the, and, the, and, and you're going to take the sales price, not, the, not the, the actual amount that's on the purchase and sale, but the adjusted sales price. That's sales price minus commissions, minus lawyer's fees, all that jazz. Not, by the way, minus the mortgage. People are always, I inevitably get somebody who says, but I got a big mortgage, I'm not going to pay any tax, right? Wrong, 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 right? <laughs> Don't subtract the mortgage, right? Many people, that's why they end up having to show up paying a big tax bill, even though they didn't make any money on their real estate set. So it's, it's, it's adjusted sales price minus basis. The capital gains rate, these are rounded, federally is 20%, about. There are a few adjustments to that, but basically it's 20%. Massachusetts, 
rounded as 5%. So think about your total capital gains rate, pretty much no matter how much you're selling property for. That's 25%. So now, going back, you got a house that's worth $400,000. They bought it for $30,000 a lot of years ago. This is not an uncommon situation for my clients, right? They lived in their house from the beginning. They raised their kids there. They want to stay until they die. Now it's time to leave. Um, they put improvements in worth $20,000. Which improvements count? I don't know. Talk to your tax guy. It's big improvements. <laughs> I did that. They're big things, right? It's not little improvements. So they've got, so their total basis is purchase price plus improvements, $50,000. Sale price, adjusted sales price, $400,000. The um, capital gain, $350,000, right? Adjusted sales price minus basis. Their tax is going to be 25% um, of that. Unless, except, if they have lived in this house for two of the last five years, lived in it and owned it for two of the last five years, then, once you figure out the capital gain, they're going to be entitled to an exclusion, the capital gain exclusion of $500,000, $250,000 for each one of them. By the way, you don't get that exclusion by virtue of being old. That used to be the case a long time ago. That's not the case. You get it by virtue of having lived in the house and owned it for two years. Now, this becomes problematic for folks who have given their property away to their kids because they were trying to do it for, for, for asset protection purposes. But now, because they were afraid of going to a nursing home, but now they want to sell their house, right? But their kids don't live in that house. So they're not entitled to the capital gains exemption for virtue of the fact that they lived there for two of the last five years. So now they want their kids to give them back the house so they can go sell it. <laughs> Except when they do that, they're going to live there another two years. They're going to live there another two years. Because you have to have lived in it and owned it for two years prior to the sale in order to get your exemption. That's just a little piece of trivia uh, as we're going along here. So, regarding the house, uh, if there were no capital gain, purchase price 40, or excuse me, sale, uh, does it sales 400,000 minus the basis of 50 is 350, tax is 25%, $87,500. That's what they're going to pay in capital gain tax. If they didn't own the house and live in it for the previous two years. Um, if, though, um, Frank died, uh, and then Mary goes to sell the house. The way that that gets figured out, go back to the basis analysis. Remember, they purchased the house for 30, 30000 and then they had improvements of twenty, so their total basis was fifty. So technically, when two people own a house, they split the basis, right? So technically, Mary had a basis in that case of 25000 and Frank had a basis of 25000 If Frank dies, and we're going, to, we're going to hear this more during this presentation. When Frank dies, his basis jumps to the date, his date of death value, which is one of the reasons why people tend to hold on to real estate until they die, because it makes the capital gains tax go away. So if Frank dies and his house is worth $400,000, his basis in his half of the house jumps from $25,000, because he's dead. So really, it's the basis that Mary's getting. But that half of the house, the basis jumps from $25,000 to $200,000. Um, and if Mary goes to sell the house, this is how it works, right? Sales price is $400,000, right? The basis is, um, this is hers, 50, her 50%, right, of the house, which was 50% of 50000 which was $25,000. And then... This, this stepped up basis that she just got from her husband, 50% of the $400,000, which was $200,000. So her basis if she sells the house is $225,000. Meaning, so that the sale, the, 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 uh, the amount subject to capital gain is 400 minus 225, or only 175. Um, Mary's exemption, remember, because Mary still has her exemption for a $250,000 exemption. Mary's exemption is $250,000. So even in this case, she pays no capital gains tax. But this is the reason. That's how it works. Okay? Um, one more, one more, and, we're gonna, and then I'm going to take questions. Because I, I am gonna, this is a new, also unusual. I'm going to take questions at, at the end of each one of these sections because they are really complicated, right? One more example, though. Say the house was worth $800,000 instead of $400,000. Which, you know, where things are going, you know, that's not an uncommon price now. Like in the next town, in Sudbury, you know, and heading east, these prices are turning into numbers like that. Or Hawkinson, huge price. So, 
Suppose the house is worth eight hundred thousand dollars. Same thing. Sales price eight hundred thousand. Fifty percent of her basis is twenty-five. Fifty percent of that of the of fifty percent of his basis now, because the because the sale because the date of death was eight hundred thousand, is four hundred thousand. So total basis is four twenty-five. Sales price minus basis is three seventy-five. Remember, she's got a um, she's got a um, um, which means the the she's got an exemption of two fifty. So three seventy-five minus two fifty is one twenty-five. So she actually pays a tax in this case. She pays a tax on the remaining on that remaining one twenty-five. Twenty-five percent of it, which is thirty-one thousand two hundred fifty thousand two hundred fifty dollars. Uh, I'm just going to do this last one. And then I'm going to take questions. By the way, this is another one of those little tricks of the trade. Suppose that Frank owned the whole house on the moment that he died, as opposed to just owning half the house. Well, in that case, Mary goes to sell the house. She sells it for eight hundred thousand. His basis stepped up to the date of death value, which is eight hundred thousand dollars. There's no tax. So why wouldn't people do this just before death? You just transfer the property to the guy that's the one that's about to die. So that you get your stuff up in basis. The answer is the federal government thought of that, <laughs> but actually not until fairly recently. For a long time, you could do this, and so they finally patched up that loophole, but not totally. They said um, if you if you have done this, if you if Mary had transferred her interest to Frank, and then Frank died the next day, they wouldn't get he, she wouldn't get his that extra step up in basis unless she had done it a year before. Unless she had done it a year before. We just did this on Martha's Vineyard, where I had a couple that had owned a house, a wonderful little house in Oak Bluff. Actually, not a nice, nice house, like three houses from the water in Oak Bluff. Nice. nice house. Worth about a million three, and they paid like 200000 for it many years ago. Um, and he was and he was dying of melanoma. Uh, he, he was a Vietnam veteran, a palm, did multiple melanomas. So, and they had, we were doing some planning, and they had no idea of this, just because she plans on selling this property after he dies. He's been, he loves this property. He always wanted to come back. She's gonna sell it, she's gonna move to Florida. They live in Pennsylvania. So, I told them about this last summer, last summer of 2015. So they actually transferred the house, like last November, November of last year. So as of next week, as long as he's still alive, right? If he lives past next week and they go and, and then dies, and she sells the property for a million two, she'll pay no capital gains tax. Because the basis of the property will jump to the date of death value. Um, so now, uh, any questions on any of this part from capital gains? Um, this piece? Yes. Is, is that five hundred thousand dollar capital gains exemption? Is that a one time deal? Is the capital gains exemption a one time exemption? No. No. Uh, and as a matter of fact, it repeats every two years. I had thought, until I, one wonderful thing about being Myrick O'Connell, you know, I, I do all the law, there are guys there, that's all you do is do tax. So I actually asked the question, if you sell, I have a person who's got a house in Framingham and a house of the cake. And they said, well, you know, I want to sell the, we want to sell the house in Framingham where we always live. And get the exemption, and they move to the cake for two years and then sell that one, right? And get the exemption there. I said, I don't think you can do that. I think you get the first one after two years, but I think the second one you have to wait five. Right? I was wrong. You actually get it, just keep doing it just every two years. It. That's why home builders never pay tax. <laughs> right? They just keep building bigger houses, you know, and selling their house and getting the exemption for the house that they live in, right? And getting the exemption and buying the next house up. Okay? So, what if Peter, Paul, and Mary Jr. inherit this house? Um, in that case, going back to the original price, if they inherit the house, their basis is going to jump to four hundred thousand dollars. The death of the second of the two of, of Frank and Mary, and therefore they're going to pay a zero capital gains tax. So Frank and Mary, and Peter Paul and Mary Jr. have a real incentive to not sell this house to some extent until after Frank and Mary have died. Uh, what about the cottage? Now we're going to talk about. Depreciation recapture. Raise your hand if you've ever heard of depreciation recapture. Oh, uh, you know, we got a couple of tax guys here, all right? So, oh, so they're going to give it a test to see if I get this right. I think I, I, think I got it. Um, so there's their product, and it's on the cake. And uh, they love it, and they've been going there for years. Uh, and they bought it 30 years ago for $100,000. And they made home improvements of another $100,000. Um, but they've rented it every year. They've rented the cottage every year. So that they could, you know, a lot of people do that, right? So they get some kind of a tax benefit because you rent the cottage and you get the income, and every year you get to take 
some depreciation. You get to take a percentage of the value of the property and subtract it from your income every year. Because in theory, the property is going down in value. <laughs> <laughs> so, so that's how depreciation. So that's why a lot of people buy these properties, you know, and they get the depreciation benefit, and you get to go to the Cape every year, you know, and the depreciation kind of pays for the vacation. But but there is there is a there is a there is a ultimately somebody pays for this. Um, so if you're renting the cottage out, and the property has to be depreciated, it has to be depreciated. You have to take the depreciation every year that you're renting the cottage out. Um, and without going through how much that is per year, trust me, at the end of 30 years. That means that they've depreciated this cottage down to zero. So the tax basis of the cottage at this point is zero. So now, what if they want to sell? Well, the adjusted sales price, you know what that is, it's $300,000. Their basis, we already said, is zero. What happens, though, regarding the tax is the value of the property gets divided into two chunks. There's one chunk which gets taxed at 100, at 25%. Remember the federal plus the state? And that's $100,000. That's everything other than their, their old basis that they depreciated away. Because remember their basis was 100000 that they paid for it and another 100000 in improvement. So their basis was $200,000. They depreciated all, that all the way. But when they sell that cottage, the depreciation recaptured, the amount of that depreciation that they are now recapturing or getting back in the sales price, they're paying for that at ordinary income tax rates. Did I get that right? not at capital gains tax rate. Um, remember, Frank and Mary's annual income is $55,000, right? Their hard, highest marginal rate was 15%. Remember we saw that slide, right? But if they sell the property and add another 200,000, which is the depreciation recapture piece, to that 55,000, now they're making a boatload of money that year, right? They're making 200 plus 55 or 255,000. The way that tax gets computed, right, is the first the, the first chunk of money is, is being or, or one chunk of money is being paid at 15 percent, and that's that amount. And then there's the 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 oh, oh by the way, this is the amount above their original 55 thousand dollars, right? So the first piece above 55 thousand, this is how the 200 thousand gets cut up, right? Gets taxed at 15 percent, and then this big chunk, 76 thousand, gets taxed at uh, 25 percent. And then there's $103,000 out of that $200,000 that's getting taxed at 28%. That's just federal, right? So there's the, total, there's the total federal tax on that piece. Then there's the federal capital gains on the, on the $100,000, right, which is $20,000, 20%. Then there's the state capital gains on the whole thing, or another $15,000. Boy, after a while, it adds up, you know? So their total tax on a $300,000 cottage sale is $86,000, right? So there's, there may be a reason, you know, so when they're trying to weigh out, do I really want to qualify Mary for Mass Health? Right? Because I'm going to save some money if I do, but oh look, I'm going to pay $86,000. Well, you know, sooner or later though, you know, taxes have to get paid. Except that if Frank and Mary both die, uh, and the kids sell the property, Peter, Paul, and Mary Jr., adjusted sales price is $300,000, stepped up basis is $300,000, they get to sell it for zero. Right? So now they're trying to weigh that out. Now, in the back of their minds, though, people are starting to say, and by the way, um, if, what about if just Frank dies? If just Frank dies, adjusted sales price is $300,000. Remember, Frank's basis would step up to $150,000 or half of that. Right? The amount that would be taxable would just be Mary's half of the property. Um, if they both die, there's no tax to the children. We just talked about that. But in the back of your mind, you're saying, but wait a minute, I thought this is the estate tax, right? And so I, I, a lot of times, my, my advisors are telling me, I need to transfer these properties out of my name so I can get them out of my estate for estate tax purposes. And that used to be that that was really important. Back when the, the amount, the, the, the amount of, of the size of your estate um, that was subject to the federal estate tax exemption, before which you started paying federal tax was like a million bucks. Because the federal tax rates are very high. Higher than a lot of these income tax rates. And so the goal was always to get property out of the estate so that they're not subject to the estate tax. But that's no longer the case. The federal estate tax 
uh, don't only starts applying if, if you're, you're a couple, uh, when the first one dies, to the taxable estate over 5.4 some odd million dollars. And if that spouse doesn't use that exemption, the other spouse gets it. So when the second spouse dies, you get to have an estate of $10.8 million. How many in this audience are going to be affected by that? <laughs> you know, the same thing is true, by the way, in Nantucket. Very, very few people, right? Very few people are affected by those numbers, right? It's just they, they happen to have a very valuable piece of real estate, right? So the question then is, how do you weigh out this, the, all this federal and state income tax issue versus the massive choose it to stay tax? So now we're going to do the estate tax 101. So many years ago, I think it was in the 20s, the Massachusetts estate tax was created. Um, and, and the notion was that anybody who had more than $40,000 was rich and therefore should be subject to the estate tax. And so they created the original <laughs> estate tax table, which is still in effect, right? And it says, if your taxable estate is between forty and ninety thousand dollars, you actually pay an estate tax, and it's eight, eight tenths of one percent, right? And between ninety and one hundred and forty, it gets doubled. It's all the way up to one point six percent, and then it just keeps going up. So when you get to the part between eight hundred forty thousand dollars and a million forty, uh, the tax rate on that money is five point six percent, right? And that's still in effect, except that I think it was in the sixties. Um, when real estate started climbing. I mean, I still remember in the 50s where you could buy a house, it was, you know, new house, $17,000, you know, 18, right? Some of you folks remember these, right? You're old enough to remember some of this stuff. But then things started climbing, right? And so the state legislators, induced by the politicians, said, or by the public, said, wait, minute, this is nutty, you know? We shouldn't be taxing people with four, a $40,000 estate, you know, or even a $100,000 estate, right? Um, so what we're going to do is we're going to, without changing this chart, we're going to superimpose this kind of magic number. And we're going to say, if your taxable estate is below that magic number, you don't have to pay any estate tax. Which then led to the question, well, what happens if you're a dollar over? Um, right? What happens? And we're going to talk about that in a couple minutes. So anyway, that's the chart, except the magic number now, it has increased over time, is now a million dollars. And every one of you, I bet, do that number. Right? Oh, if you have an estate of less than a million dollars, you don't pay any tax. Which leads back to that other question. Um, um, so that's what we just talked about. There's a million dollars. That's how the exemption works. What happens if you're a dollar over? Now, in, in some states, and in, in, in Rhode Island until recently, they, their estate tax is referred to a, as a cliff tax. Um, there was this magic number that the, that the legislature had adopted. It was like 600 and something thousand dollars. And if you were at that number or below, you paid no tax. If you got a dollar over that number, you paid all the money that you would have paid on the on the on their chart up to that point, which ended up being like thirty-six thousand dollars. Wow! Right. So that was, was nutty. So how Massachusetts dealt with it instead is they said this, and it always applied no matter where you were, but now it applies to dollars over a million dollars. If you're over a million dollars, then your 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 Massachusetts estate tax rate, it or, or or your Massachusetts estate tax is the lower of the amount you would have paid according to that chart that I showed you, or 40% of all the dollars over a million. So if you have an estate of a million, a taxable estate of a million dollars, you pay no tax. If you have a taxable estate of a uh, million one hundred thousand dollars, right? Oh, and by the way, so there's the, there's the numbers. If you had a taxable estate of a million dollars, and you looked at the chart using the, the chart that I showed you, you'd owe $36,560. But as I said, the first million is exempt. So using the 40% thing, you, you get zero. And the lower of those two is zero. So you pay zero. If your estate is a million one hundred thousand dollars, you do the same thing. If you use the table, right, the amount that you would should be paying is forty two thousand six hundred forty dollars. If you take forty percent of all the dollars over a million, the tax is forty thousand dollars. Forty percent of a hundred thousand dollars, right? 40,000 is lower than the other, and therefore the tax that you pay is $40,000. Get to a million two, and it flips, because that's where the change occurs, between a million one and a million two. Using the table, you'd owe $49,040. 40% of all the dollars over a million would be $80,000, right? So now you're way higher, right? Which one's lower? 49,040, so that's what you pay in tax, and that's how it works from then on. You get to a million five, right? This whole, this exemption thing has disappeared, right? It disappeared in here, right? And so now you're just paying the amount 
that you would pay using that table, which is um, $68,240, right? So in the state of a million five, that's what's at risk. The maximum that's at risk is $68,240. So compare that to just the sale of that cottage, right? Remember the sale of the cottage, if, if, the, if the two parents sell the cottage, they're paying a tax of $83,000, right? If the cottage weren't included in the estate because they had sold the cottage first and spent all the money, if they hadn't spent the money, it's still going to be included in the estate. But if they had, if they sold the cottage and then spent all the money, or, or if they'd given away the cottage, the, 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 the resulting shrinkage in the, the size of their taxable estate would only have been that $300,000, which would have shrunk their tax by some little piece of that $68,240. So in that situation, they derive a tremendous benefit from holding on to that property until they die. So, the, 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 what are the restructuring costs that Frank and Mary have, would have to pay in order if they wanted Mary to qualify for Mass Health? And by the way, there's no doubt that if Mary qualifies for Mass Health, you know, she derives a benefit, right? Because from then on in, um, her, the, the nursing home cost minus her Social Security check which, if I recall correctly, was $1,000 a month, um, is going to get paid by Mass Health. So if she's in a nursing home, then on private pay, they'd be paying 12, I'm going to round 13000 a month. That's not an unusual number. Minus the $1,000 in Social Security, that means the burn rate on her savings, on their savings, is $12,000 a month, or $144,000 a year. So if Mary's going to be living for a prolonged period, right, even in this case, it may very well make sense to do all of this other stuff in order to qualify for math for mass health. But my point is, it's a math question. You got to kind of figure out the math, right? Um, what's the you know? There's the taxes just on the cottage, right? If she's going to, if Frank is going to surrender that old annuity in order to turn it into this other annuity, what's the surrender charge? Is any of that money taxable? What's the tax on that? Um, he's now going to be losing, say his annuity was paying him 5% a year. 5% of uh, $200,000, that's $10,000 a year. That's going to be dropping to 1% a year, right? You talked about the fact that the annuity that he would have to buy in order to qualify Mary is to pay from it, right? Um, and then there's the tax on Mary's money. Remember Mary had that IRA, federal, <coughs> and, and, and she's going to be paying money. You remember the federal tax rate, 15% to 28%, right? Um, if, if, it's a, if, if, we, if she were doing all of this at the end of the year, like around now, one of the things that she would consider doing is splitting that IRA into two pieces and cashing in half right now and half, ne half next year, just so that she could get into those lower marginal tax rate brackets. Remember we talked about the fact that the key is to keep out of those high brackets because you get taxed so much more money in the high brackets. So I guess what I'm saying is there's really a balance here. And Frank and Mary, Frank would have to be looking at, this is a hard question. How long is Mary going to live? How long is Mary going to live in the nursing home? Right? Because if she's going to live for a long time, then no doubt about it, all this other stuff is worth it. Because she's saving $144,000 a year by being on Mass Health. If, on the other hand, she's, you know, in, in, but, but a year, two years is a long time in a nursing home. If, she, if Frank thinks Mary is going to be dying soon, this may not make sense. What about pre crisis planning? We're just going to talk about that a little bit. So should Frank and Mary be gifting the cottage right now in order to make sure that in order to qualify for Mass Health, they don't have to go sell the cottage, right? Well, that wouldn't be a great idea if all they're doing is gifting their basis to their kids, right? Because if they're giving the, this, this basis to their kids and the basis is zero, then when the kids go to sell the property, what you're going to do is you're going to take that $300,000, which is all profit, Right? Because their basis was zero. Their, no, excuse me. Their basis was, well, as to the depreciated, no, as to the whole thing, their basis was zero. No, 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 because they, because, no, because they're, no, that you're right, it is zero. <laughs> Put that all on camera, right? <laughs> we don't want to edit that out. We want to see the people to see that. I'm really confused about it. That's right, because they because their purchase price plus improvements was two hundred thousand and they depreciated it all the way. So when Frank and when Peter Paul and Mary Jr. go to sell, all three hundred thousand dollars is profit. 
And remember, a piece of that profit is going to be the, was the, was going to be the capital gain, but a piece of it is recaptured depreciation, right? So they're going to be paying, and Frank's going to be paying. Frank, pretend Frank is in a, in a, in a lawyer and is working, got a good job. He's probably already in a 33% bracket, right? Say Paul is, earns less, right? Say Paul's bracket's only 25%. That extra $100,000 he's going to get, his third of the 300000 could have pushed him way up. Maybe Mary's is going to be different. So by giving them the cottage, by the way, they're actually really, if they expect the kids to be selling the cottage, they're actually not treating their kids the same. They're not, although they intended to. Because in terms of after-tax dollars, they're giving a lot more to Mary than they are to Peter. Um, maybe they want to transfer the property and retain a life estate in the property. What is the advantage of this? Um, if they retain a life estate in the property, then for tax, for estate tax purposes, they still own it. And if they, when they die, that basis is still going to get stepped up. But, but if they've done that at least five years prior to the date on which Mary has to qualify for mass health, the house will no longer be coming. This is problematic though if the property gets sold during their lifetime. Right? Um, but this also avoids probate. If they, if they structure things this way, because upon their death, this property doesn't have to go through the probate process, their life estate evaporates, the kids become the owners of the property. They may want to create a trust. This is probably, for married people, this is the only time that we, that we recommend that people actually create an irrevocable trust and transfer stuff into it and wait five years, as if you've got a cottage like this. Because otherwise, the, just because of the reasons that I gave you, the, the cost of unwinding the cottage and selling it and the taxes and all this stuff, there's a tremendous cost involved, right? If you, if, you know, the advantage is that you keep control of the property until you have to do that, but there's a big cost. Whereas if they, if they, if they especially if they're thinking the cottage is going to stay in the family anyway, the cottage is the thing they may want to transfer out to an irrevocable trust, name one or more of the kids as the trustees, wait the five years, then they know that if Frank or Mary needs to qualify for mass health, they're going to be safe. Um, and then the question regarding the home. Should they be selling it now or should they be selling it later? You know, we talked about this, right? That the, uh, their, tax is going to, their, their tax right now, if they sell it, is going to be zero. Um, if they had a more valuable house, then Mary might be paying a tax, and therefore they might decide that they want to be holding on, holding on to it until the, the kids die. Uh, for other places, I talk about qualified personal residence trusts, so-called Cuperts. I bet no one here has got one of those. The issue with Cuperts, this was a very popular device it was sold to a lot of people with, with bigger homes or larger estates uh, back in the 90s to cause people to be out of the estate tax system. Basically, you would create this trust, you give the property to this trust controlled by your kids, you rent the property for a given number of years, thereby having a beneficial tax consequence. And at the end of the day, the property wouldn't be in your estate. A ton of people on Nantucket and Martha's Vineyard have these. They're going to get, they're going to absolutely killed as, re, as, as a capital gains result. Because if you, if they gifted their property, they, I'm going to give you my example of the folks that I was talking about before. But they bought this property for a couple hundred thousand dollars in the 90s. It's now worth a million two. I, actually, I had a case a lot like that. The basis in the property was actually fifty thousand dollars. And it's in Medicaid, and, and on the east side of, the west side of the Nantucket, it is special. And it's also two point four million dollars, right? And they were all excited because the, 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 this was this was an inherited property, and the parents had put the property into one of these cuperts, so that the property would not be included in the estate of the parents. And the parents are now both dead, and it worked great. Right? Except that now the kids, they got one child here and one child in um, the grandchildren are in California, so they want to sell the cottage to go to California. And I said, don't sell that cottage because their capital gain is on the difference between the basis, which is I think $50,000, and the, and the two point something million dollars that it's worth. Oh my God. Okay. So they got a whole lot to that property, right? In order to get it stepped up for their kids. Benefit. But we're not gonna talk about kids. Um, so, the bottom line here, when you're trying to figure this out, right? The, the takeaway is, you need three people to figure this out. You need me, right? Or somebody that looks like me, right? You need, a, you need an L law attorney. But you also need a tax person. That's not me. It can be one of the other lawyers in our office, but you might not want that. You may want your CPA, right? But the point is, don't ask your CPA to be your lawyer. 
but ask your lawyer to be your CPA. But ask your CPA whether or not it's worth it to qualify for Mass Health. Don't ask your lawyer whether it's worth it. Talk to the two of them at the same time. And bring in your investment person. Remember the example I gave you from the beginning. If you're getting killed in your investments and a lot of your money is in investments, so that the net effect of qualifying for Mass Health is that you're reducing your income by a huge amount, right? And go back to that question, how long is Mary going to live, right? Because once you bought it, once Frank has bought into that long-term annuity at 1%, he's stuck with it. If Mary dies, he's going to keep getting that 1% for the next 5 or 10 years as opposed to the 5 or 7% that he might have been earning someplace else. So you want all three people to be having that conversation with you, all right? Uh, if you thought this was just wonderful, but I was talking too fast, you can always watch it again on YouTube, on Frank and Mary's YouTube channel, or on Hudson Cable. And, and, and we really appreciate the fact that Hudson Cable, like all of the people, posts these and you can download them. You can... Any questions? Uh, it was a lot of stuff. <laughs> I know people are kind of like, well, uh, any questions? Uh, if not, um, thank you very much for coming. Yeah. Uh, have a wonderful holiday, and we'll see you next year. Yeah.